A bar that turns tea breaks into tiny ceremonies, that rides along in lunchboxes like a lucky charm, and that somehow tastes exactly the way memory says it should. Kit Kat. How do they make four neat fingers of wafer and chocolate behave so politely, break so satisfyingly, and melt with such reliable charm? I have walked chocolate lines for half a century, and the Kit Kat Ballet still makes me grin like I have never seen a conveyor before. So pull on a hairnet, tuck away those sleeves, and walk with me. By the end, you will never look at that little logo on top the same way again. So, where does this story begin? Not with a mold or a wrapper, but with the ingredients that have to agree to be friends. Cocoa, sugar, milk, wheat, a whisper of vanilla, a neutral cocoa butter sheen that gives everything that glossy wink. Let's start with cocoa. Picture humid farms where pods grow like lanterns on trunks. Inside those pods are the beans that get fermented, dried, roasted, and ground into cocoa liquor. That liquor gets pressed to separate two personalities. Cocoa butter, pale and luxurious, and cocoa solids, intense and a bit moody. A good chocolate needs both. The butter for melt, the solids for soul. And different factories tune the ratio like musicians tuning a piano, because a Kit Kat needs a very particular snap and melt. Too much butter and it gets soft and shy. Too little and it gets dull and grumpy. Sugar has its own journey, from cane fields or sugar beets, refined until it looks like snow that forgot to be cold. It is not just sweet, it is structure. It affects viscosity, flow, even the way the chocolate sets in a mold. Then there's milk, usually in powdered form for consistency. It smooths the flavor, rounds the edges, and helps build that friendly, creamy melt you expect. Vanilla or vanillin arrives to whisper, not shout. You would miss it if it were gone, even if you cannot point to it when it is there. Salt, a pinch, wakes the chocolate up like a stretch in the morning. Now for the heart of a Kit Kat, the wafer. Flour arrives from mills that watch protein levels the way pilots watch gauges. Too much protein and your wafer eats like cardboard. Too little and it turns into a fragile diva that collapses when you try to spread cream on it. Starch, leavening agents, a neutral vegetable fat, sugar, and a carefully tempered water addition create a batter that is thinner than pancake, thicker than a secret. The point is air. You are building a lattice of tiny cells that will bake into feather light crispness. I once stuck my finger in a mixing bowl and the line lead laughed. He said, it should feel like runny paint. He was right. And yes, I asked before I did it, most days. All right, into the machine. The building hums with a gentle throb that smells like warmth and chocolate. Bulk sacks unload sugar into silos. Liquor tanks hold roasted cocoa like velvet. Milk powder rests in stainless hoppers that look like rocket fuel tanks for dessert. On my left, the wafer batter mixer rotates with a slow confidence. On my right, a stack of baking plates cycles through an oven that is longer than a city bus. The batter spreads in a whisper-thin layer across a heated steel plate. A top plate kisses it shut. The oven carries the pair through zones that are tuned within a breath. You can watch the surface go from glossy to matte, then to a delicate beige. When the plates open, a wafer sheet slides out that is the size of a coffee table, but light enough to lift with two fingers. Tap it and you hear a dry little click. Music to a chocolate maker's ears. The sheets move along a cooling deck, fans blowing a polite breeze. They need to relax before anyone touches them, or they crack out of spite. While they chill, the wafer cream is mixing. This is a spreadable paste made from sugar, fats that stay solid at room temperature, cocoa powder, and very often a finely milled rework crumb. Rework is a lovely word in factories. It is what happens to the bars that are slightly imperfect. They are ground back into a delicate crumb and folded into the cream, where they bring back pure Kit Kat flavor and frankly, 
cut down on waste. Nothing tragic about it. It is smart, and it keeps the flavor true. The texture is silky, but firm enough to stand. Think of a chocolate buttercream that went to engineering school. A spreading head applies a thin, even layer of cream to a wafer sheet. Then a second sheet lands on top like a duvet. Cream again, wafer again. Usually three wafer sheets make two cream layers, though plants can play with height to match the target profile. The stack glides through a pressing station that brings everything into crisp alignment. No slumps allowed. It then enters a conditioning tunnel, cool and dry, so the fats in the cream can set. There is a smell here I adore. Not blunt chocolate, not bakery. It is the calm, sweet scent of ingredients deciding to become one thing together. Now, the cutting. A waterfall of precise blades transforms whole sheets into long fingers. The sound is soft, almost like thick paper being trimmed in a print shop. These fingers line up like little soldiers headed to a parade. Every edge is clean. The spacing is exact. A camera checks spacing and height at a glance, and a puff of air politely nudges any vagrant finger back into line. Does the machine really do that? Yes, it does. And it is charming. Chocolate time. We step into tempering, and if there is a chapel in a chocolate factory, this is it. Tempering is the art of convincing cocoa butter to crystallize in a form that snaps brightly, melts at body temperature, and shines like a new coin. You lower the chocolate's temperature, raise it, lower it again, and keep it moving so the correct crystal form wins the popularity contest. Operators watch curves on a screen and watch the chocolate in the tank because numbers are only half the truth. When it is right, the flow looks like silk. When it is wrong, it sulks. I have seen new technicians learn to tell by the way the drip falls back into the bowl. It is oddly beautiful. From here, factories take one of two paths. Some lines mold, some enrobe. Many Kit Kats are molded to get that crisp Kit Kat logo and the elegant forms on each finger. In a molding line, a carousel of polycarbonate molds circulates under a depositor that lays down a precise bed of tempered chocolate into each cavity. The mold vibrates. Tiny bubbles flee to the surface like they were late for a train. Long wafer fingers settle into the warm chocolate bed. Then a second deposit flows over the top to backfill. The mold vibrates again for good measure and then rides a cooling tunnel that sets the shell. When it demolds, you see it. The logo is crisp, the corners tidy, and the seam line on the side looks like a tuxedo lapel. It is hard not to clap. Other plants do it with an enrober, which is also a kind of magic. Picture a thin waterfall of tempered chocolate. The wafer fingers pass through, get bottomed with a thin chocolate layer, then covered by the curtain. An air knife trims excess, and that classic wave pattern on the bottom appears as the belt's mesh imprint. How do you get the logo with enrobing? A stamp roller, a light template pass, or a post deposit for the top plate can place that mark. Depends on the line. Either way, the result is the same for you. A tidy, even coat with the correct thickness because bite feel matters. Too thick and the chocolate bullies the wafer. Too thin and the wafer tastes naked. The target is laser precise. Look, it takes our whole crew to get these cameras into these amazing places. And honestly, the only way we can keep making these adventures happen is because of your support. If you're enjoying this, just a quick tap on that like button helps us out more than you know. From all of us, thank you for that. Out of tempering and coating, the bars ride into a cooling tunnel. The air in here is cool, very dry, and patient. Fast cooling would shock the chocolate and create blooms or dullness. Slow and steady gives you gloss and strength. The tunnel has zones like a polite conversation. 
cool, a little cooler, then back to room temp on the exit. As the bars emerge, a row of cameras checks for surface defects. A speck of bloom, a drip, a scuff, puffs of air or little fingers nudge offenders off the main line to be reworked. Everyone else keeps marching toward the great reveal. Here is my favorite bit of nerdy joy. The snap. We talk about snap like it is a character trait, but it is physics, crystal chemistry, and geometry. Cocoa butter has several crystal forms and only one of them gives you that crisp break with a friendly melt. Proper tempering builds that form dominantly. Now add the wafer. Those airy cells in the wafer sheets set at just the right moisture level create tiny bridges that collapse into crunch. The cream between layers is firm enough to hold, soft enough to shear without pulling layers apart. The grooves between fingers are scored to encourage the break to happen where you expect. You push down, the chocolate resists, the wafer whispers, then you get that polite crack that says, yes, you may. Factories actually test this. They use little instruments that press and record the force at break. And yes, they sometimes listen to the sound with microphones. Crispy foods make higher frequency spikes. A good Kit Kat gives a neat little signature. Seeing that graph for the first time made me laugh out loud. It was like reading music for a snack. Let's talk textures and thicknesses for a second. That top coat of chocolate is not arbitrary. It is measured to tenths of a millimeter. It must be thick enough to protect the wafer from humidity because wafers hate moisture the way cats hate baths. It must be thin enough to yield quickly when you bite so your teeth meet wafer without a wrestling match. The bottom coat, the one with the wave, is slightly thicker to act as a raft. By now the bars have cooled to a pleasant snap and we stroll into packaging where speed and choreography look like a magic trick. Single bars line up nose to tail and ride into a flow wrapper. A printed film unwinds from a reel, threads through rollers, and meets the bars right on time. Registration marks on the film talk to sensors that keep the graphics centered so the logo lands exactly where your eye expects it. A thin seal closes the long edge. End seal jaws kiss the ends shut, crimp and cut and out comes a glossy packet with a date code and a lot stamp that tells you exactly when and where this little fellow was born. Multipacks get collated and tucked into larger sleeves or cartons. Those iconic two-finger and four-finger formats are not just for looks. They help with portioning and with that ceremonial snap we set up earlier. Every choice here has a reason. Quality control does not nap. A check weigher looks at each pack's mass and rejects anything that strays. Metal detectors and x-ray machines watch for any foreign objects with an intensity that would make a lighthouse jealous. Vision systems read the wrapper print to make sure colors sit in tolerance and the seal lines are clean. At scheduled intervals, operators pluck samples and walk them to a small on-site kitchen. They measure gloss with a tiny meter. They check for bloom. They break fingers and record force. They taste. They always taste. Numbers are nice. Mouths are honest. Cartoning happens with a kind of quiet pride. Cases build on pallets with interlocks that make the stack strong. Labels print with barcodes, product codes, and those mysterious strings of characters that mean everything to a distribution center and nothing to your cousin. Pallets ride forklifts into climate-controlled storage where the world's most delicious Tetris happens. Then it is trucks, warehouses, stores, and your hand. Along the route, temperature and humidity are logged. Chocolate does not like heat spikes or damp so the cold chain and the dry chain are looked after with text messages and alarms. If something wobbles, someone's phone chirps and there is a course correction. A lot of quiet heroism lives in logistics teams. And now we have come full circle to your kitchen table, your office desk, your backpack on a train. When you crack a finger, 
you are finishing a journey that began in a field and passed through mixers, ovens, presses, temperers, tunnels, and a thousand tiny choices by people who care. If you want to get the best from it, here's a little tip from a lifetime among chocolate. Room temperature. Too cold and the chocolate goes mute. Too warm and it sighs before you touch it. Room temp lets the snap sing and the melt whisper. Also, share. I know, I know. It is not always easy. But the ceremony of offering a finger is one of the gentlest rituals in food. It turns a snack into a story, and just like that, the journey is complete. Incredible, isn't it? The science and passion that goes into something we see every day. There are so many more stories like this to tell, so if you had a good time with me today, please make sure you're subscribed. Now I have to ask you, what food have you always wondered about? What should we investigate next? Let me know your ideas down in the comments. I truly love reading them. You never know, it might just be our next trip together. You might be wondering about varieties. Minis, chunky bars, limited editions, flavors that show up like a seasonal guest star. The architecture is the same, the details shift. Change the cream formula to include matcha or strawberry. Adjust the wafer height to fit a chunky mold that holds a single thick finger rather than four slim ones. A word on bloom, because you have probably seen it. That cloudy look on older chocolate. It can be fat bloom or sugar bloom. Fat bloom happens when cocoa butter migrates and forms crystals on the surface because the bar got warm and then cool again. Sugar bloom happens when moisture touches the surface, dissolves sugar, and then dries, leaving tiny crystals. Neither is dangerous, but both are unwanted. Factories fight bloom with tempering discipline, tight climate control, good packaging, and quick, smooth distribution. Do I still smile when a case ejects perfectly formed bars at the end of a shift? Yes, every time. I think of the farmers who coaxed cocoa from trees, the millers who watched protein levels in wheat, the drivers who backed a truck into a loading bay in one try, the operators who tuned a blower to the angle that makes crumbs behave, the maintenance crew who swapped a bearing at 2 a.m. so the oven would sing again by dawn. A Kit Kat is not just chocolate and wafer. It is teamwork you can hold. If you have ever wondered whether engineering steals the soul from food, I hope today answered that. These lines are built by people who argue, kindly, about half a degree in a tempering zone and five seconds on an oven dwell. They taste, they listen, they tweak. They love the product enough to discipline it. That is not cold. That is craft, at scale. Thank you for walking the line with me. If your fingers are itching for a break, I support that decision wholeheartedly. I'm Arthur, your factory storyteller. I will meet you at the next machine. Until then, keep your chocolate at room temp, your breaks generous, and your curiosity hungry.